Good morning, and thanks for coming. My title is uh, intentionally meant to be provocative, uh, which is to acknowledge that just about every one of you will have been conditioned to worry about uh, population growth and the alleged problems that go with it. I'll call this the received view of population growth. The fact is, this conditioning on the perils of population growth largely stems from the work of a few influential intellectuals. Uh, one of the earliest and clearest predictions concerning the problems of human population growth came from Reverend Thomas Malthus, who predicted, uh, famously predicted a future of widespread human misery and suffering caused by unmitigated uh, human reproduction. Let's look at a very simple graphical representation of the so-called Malthusian trap. Malthus' argument was, in, in essence, that a geometrically increasing population would eventually outstrip resources, uh, which you should read as food, that would only increase arithmetically. Catastrophic crises were then predicted at the point at which resources were no longer able to sustain the growing population. Now, it's important to understand that Malthus was not simply theorizing about poor countries, like those we might associate with Africa or Asia, but rich ones, like Great Britain, where he lived. In the 1960s, Paul Ehrlich captured the imagination of intellectuals, policymakers, and even school children around the world with his book, The Population Bomb. The book begins with the following quote. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. At this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. And many here have come across Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons uh, paper, also from 1968, whose theme is very similar to Ehrlich's and Malthus. Now, it's not entirely unreasonable that these authors took the positions they did. If we look at this chart of population levels over a very long time period, it actually goes from 10,000 BC to roughly today, we can see clearly that in the last few hundred years, there were pretty significant uh, population increase. But Malthus was wrong in his prediction of widespread crises and human misery, principally because he couldn't see the incredible productivity improvements in resource output but also because he misdiagnosed population trends. Ehrlich and Hardin were wrong for the same reasons. The received view on population growth has ignored that world population is likely to peak within the next century and begin to fall. Here's a diagram of the United Nations' own projections of future population trends. I draw your attention to the three dark series, this one, this one, and this one, and it, out here we have the year 2100, so this projects out about 100 years. Uh, these three projections are based on differing assumptions about fertility. In about 100 years, the high fertility assumption, this one, peaks at about 16 billion people. The medium fertility uh, assumption peaks at about 10 billion people. The low fertility assumption here peaks at about 8 billion within the next 40 or 50 years and then begins to decline. It's worth noting that this frightening looking light series here looks a lot like the geometric population trend I showed you a moment ago in the Malthusian trend. This was the United Nations high fertility assumption up to just a couple of years ago before they revised their calculations. The reason for the adjustment in projected population levels is what the economist calls the staggering decline in world fertility rates, which we can see here. We can see over the past 50 or 60 years, uh, fertility levels going from almost five children per woman to somewhere between two and three. 2.1 children per woman is a critical number because it represents the sub-replacement fertility rate or the rate at which current population simply replaces the existing population. At that rate, 2.1 children per woman, population growth is zero. A number of countries are already experiencing sub-replacement fertility 
And contrary to the received view, this trend is not exclusive to rich countries. Almost one third of these experiencing sub-replacement fertility are classified as developing. Here's a diagram of, uh, showing the rates of population growth, uh, not fertility rates, although they're obviously related. And the main thing to take away is that the yellow and green countries are the only ones that still have moderate to high population growth rates, which is largely in Central Africa. The purple countries, all up in here, uh, actually have negative growth rates and hence are already experiencing population declines. Now to the so what question. I want to argue that not enough of the world's considerable intellectual resources have been devoted to recognizing this developing trend and as a result we're not taking seriously enough the real implications of declining population growth. I'll re merely raise some questions to consider and perhaps some, it'll spur some of you to think about these in the future. Uh, so we're used to seeing and thinking about population in the following way. Lots of kids uh, down here at the bottom, and these are age brackets as we go up, and fewer numbers of individuals as we go up uh, in the age brackets. This is referred to as the population pyramid uh, for obvious reasons. An important feature of this structure is to ask what percentage of the population is working and thus able to provide for the non-working, the very young and the very old. In the traditional looking pyramid, there are lots of people in the middle brackets who are working, taking care of the old and the young. But as population slows, the population rate slows, society ages, and the pyramid looks less like a pyramid and more like I don't know, a house, perhaps. Uh, here's a population pyramid of the U.S. And you'll note this uh, little bulge in here, those are the baby boomers. Uh, and because we're living longer, they're going to be around for se at least several more decades. So that bulge is going to largely move up the uh, age brackets. Of course, people will die eventually. Uh, but that bulge is going to move through the, that age profile. And here's a projected age profile of Japan in less than 20 years. It'll soon be the oldest society the world has ever known. And it doesn't look like a pyramid or a house anymore. Unless we think this is a, only a rich country problem, here's the age profile of China presently, which is largely driven by its forced one-child policy. Aging populations have implications for the future of society. Think about the housing market. People buy houses today with the expectation that they'll be more valuable in the future. Population increase is a primary driver of that expectation. What happens today if we knew for certain that population would fall in the future and hence prices would be lower in the future? When we expect prices to be future tomorrow, we tend to buy, hold off buying today, lowering prices today. To take another example, stock markets are fundamental to allocating savings to investment purposes, and hence to the functioning of all modern economies. A large driver of stock prices is that markets grow over time because population grows over time. The firms that service those growing markets become more valuable and their share price increases as a result. Another factor driving share prices upward, traditionally, has been larger numbers of investors buying stocks over time as the population increases. As population growth slows and even turns negative, we're likely to see lower stock market returns than we have traditionally. Now consider the fairness aspect of a declining workforce paying for a large proportion of the public and many private pensions around the world that were set up on pay-as-you-go principles. In these systems, the young, working-age population pays for the health and retirement benefits of the elderly. Is it fair to expect the young to bear an ever-increasing burden for the old, especially when they've had no say in establishing those policies in the first place? Indeed, since virtually all welfare states are built precisely on these principles, 
the population slowdown has a profound implication for future democratic functioning. A final area of concern surrounds human intellectual development and innovation. It's undoubtedly true that technological advance and innovation are at least partly a function of the size of the population. In other words, one effect of an ever larger population has been a larger absolute number of individuals who can think about and potentially solve the world's problems. Consider intellectual endeavors as experiments. More people mean more experiments. Fewer people mean fewer experiments. A depopulated world is quite likely to be one in which technological advancement will slow. To wrap up, the theorizing about population growth has been the cause of considerable angst among both intellectuals and laymen for at least a couple of centuries. In my estimation, where tomorrow begins, uh, likely within a handful of decades, is a world of falling populations. This is exactly what the Malthusians and the Neo-Malthusians have wished for. But these are social dynamics that humans have not experienced in a significant way since the times of plague. Make no mistake, it's unlikely to be a panacea, the panacea frequently imagined by those who've wished for it most. We're going to need plenty of fresh young minds thinking about solutions to these very new problems. Thank you.